and um, uh, I most of my time been uh, working in the last 20 years anyway, actually training clinical psychologists, right? I also do clinical work and so on, and drawing on some of that uh, will be what I'm doing in this session. I'll be with you for three sessions, obviously, uh, um, uh, Jim's with you for the other uh, five, okay? Um, and uh, uh, hopelessly, uh, uh, hopefully, did I say hopelessly? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was saying to people actually, Freudian slip, and somebody else mentioned Freud and so on. That's actually how I did get into psychology in the first place. It was because when I was at school at the age of, tender age of 14, uh, some of my fellow pupils were mispronouncing Freud yeah. as Freud, uh, and that was my name, and they knew it was something to do with sex, so I was getting rude to it. So I went to the public library and I got up the introductory lectures uh, on psychoanalysis by, by Sigmund Freud. And it was just fascinating. I mean, it was absolutely incredible that there was a way of understanding and explaining people's feelings and their emotions and their relationships and so on. I was absolutely knocked over by this. I really was. Um, and uh, uh, went on to, you know, do a psychology degree and then to train clinically and then to be a clinical psychologist for uh, what, next year will actually be 50 years. Um, so uh, it's all down to my name. Good job I wasn't called, well, I don't know, Brunel or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, there we go. And it's great to see so many people. I mean, I'm sure Jim would have said this, but, you know, we sort of tentatively thought, oh, I wonder if we could do something on stress and resilience, which is something we're both very interested in. Wouldn't that be good? And would there be enough people to be quarried? Which I think is something like 12. There we go. Okay? Um, so we're delighted by that. We're delighted by that. The other thing I'll say, just as a preamble, uh, is that uh, I'm going to be using a lot of PowerPoint. That's the way I work. That's my medium uh, PowerPoint. Um, and uh, you know that uh, you will be sent, right? The, the, the guts of everything that, that you know, it'll be a, a little while, a few days or a week or so, uh, but then you will get everything. So you don't have to make notes of what comes on the screen. If you want to make notes of your own thoughts or something, you can do what you like, but you don't have to. You will be getting uh, uh, sent to you uh, a, a copy, not the slides as such, but of the, of the old text. Okay? okay? So there we go. So, right? So, uh, session four then of the eight sessions, uh, enhancing resilience. That's what our theme for this particular session is. It's about how you can increase resilience. Because um, I'm particularly interested in application. What you can actually do to change things for you and for other people. All right? So in this session, it's about uh, understanding and enhancing resilience. And what do we mean by resilience? Well, uh, it's the, uh, as you can read uh, from there, it's the capacity to withstand adversity, not to be knocked over by what life is throwing at you, basically, okay? And then to bounce back, to get up off the floor, as it were, dust yourself off and, and carry on, as it were, okay? And that means to uh, recover or from things that have, have not been ideal for you, from disappointment, for example, the failure at something, the loss, maybe a bereavement, uh, from trauma and so on. And you will realise that some people are actually very good at doing that, pulling themselves together, getting back on, on, on the trip, and other people uh, are not. So the opposite of resilience is vulnerability. Okay? Vulnerability, the opposite of resilience. And uh, I have a little metaphor that I use, and I use it with, uh, with clients, which is to say that somebody who's very vulnerable, it's as if they're uh, living like this on one, almost anything can knock them over. Mm. You know, you can push them over very easily. Uh, whereas this person uh, is on two feet and it's going to take a lot more to knock them over. And also there's a third position, which is the sort of uh, Welsh rugby player, like this, and there's not a lot that's going to knock them over. Do you understand? And what we want, and I often say to people, um, you know, who, who come with stress problems and so on, that my, I think my task for us to do together is to, at the moment you're living on one leg, and you know, you're vulnerable, and it's actually to get you to plant both feet on the ground, so that you can take the things which inevitably life is going to throw at you. Okay? So that's the sort of metaphor, very simple, uh, but it says something. But of course, there, uh, I've got, you know, on the one hand is vulnerable, on the other hand is resilient. 
people, uh, and you know, psychologists are always saying there are two types of people, dum dum dum, so. <coughs> but actually, almost uh, in every case of that, rather than thinking of people as either being ought like that or like that, we're talking about a dimension, we're talking about a continuum, which goes at <coughs> one extreme, highly vulnerable, and at the other extreme, highly resilient. Right? So what we really want to be able to do is to help people to become further up towards the blue end. We want to help people to be more resilient. Uh, and, but we need to know, first of all, why are some people here and some people here and some people here? What determines where you are on this scale? Um, and that's an interesting question, and it's a question for which there's been lots of uh, research. And so we know some of the factors that are involved. And one of them is constitution, genetics. And you can actually, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we can draw on animal experiments. We can breed animals uh, that are particularly resilient to stress. And we can also breed animals to be particularly non-resilient to stress. That's called behavior genetics, where we actually, um, um, you know, so breed for a particular psychological characteristic. So we know that genetics is evolved, which would mean that in the human population, there are, in a sense, families where, you know, low resilience is actually the norm in that. And other families which are, I don't know what you call them, tough or hard or whatever it is, okay? So constitution, genetics, does actually account for some of the variation uh, between people but also you're helpful. If you're optimistic and confident, then you tend to be more resilient. That contributes to your resilience. Um, and this is something, you can't change genetics, but we can change people's optimism. Okay, there's a thing called learned optimism. So that's one way in which maybe we'll be able to increase resilience. And then there are life experiences. What have been your life experiences? In childhood, early experiences, as we know, some children have traumatic lives in the early years, and other children are in secure attachment relationships. But also recent experiences. If you've had a double whammy in your life, if you, you know, your wife has left you and your mother died unexpectedly, and so on. Okay, that can be too much. So Recent experiences and early experiences, you get weakened by those experiences, to some extent. And then finally, in this list, is your general level of well-being, or thriving. And we know that people who thrive, people who have high well-being, are more resilient. That's one of the correlates of well-being, is that your resilience is relatively so we can see that you know, it's quite complex, there's lots of different factors, there are more than this if you wanted to extend the list, as it were, but these are some of the main uh, things. Yes? Just how about people, I mean I know people and I would say about myself, who are very resilient in certain areas of their life, but then very vulnerable well, yeah, in a no, particular no, 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 area, like, a bit like Shakespeare's you know, tragic heroes of their tragic yeah, yeah, flaws. Yeah. No, no, I, I wouldn't deny that at all. So then it can be specific, all right? But we, yeah, and, and so we can talk about resilience in terms of sort of health threats, or in terms of economic threats, or in terms of whatever, okay? But, but there will be, let's think of it as a general factor as well, that some people clearly are vulnerable to almost anything adverse that life throws at them, okay? So, so I, I go certainly a little, a bit a lot, a, along with that, okay? Um, so it's almost like there's a general intelligence, but there's also specific intelligence for this and for this and for this. Okay. Now, vulnerability in childhood experiences, there's been some uh, interesting studies uh, on that. Um, and it's uh, a little more um, complicated than you might expect. What you might expect is that the, um, uh, the, the more uh, uh, trauma you've had, the more adverse experiences that you've had, the more vulnerable you will be. It's not quite like that. Because what's been found is that very little adversity in childhood, always getting straight A's in school, never being bullied, always having lots of friends, always being popular, actually can make you vulnerable. Because when then something does come along, you don't know how to handle that. You've never been through that. You've never developed any skills that could help you to deal with that. 
Whereas some adversity can help the person to develop coping skills. It's great if you can say, do you know, I've been through worse than this before, and come out the other side. If you can say that, then you've got that confidence, you've got that what we call self-efficacy. I can do that. I can handle this. Yeah? So having some adversity, you can learn from it. You might know the saying that, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There's some sort of element of truth in that. But of course, if a child has lots of adverse experiences in childhood, then they might well be traumatized. Uh, and this often leaves the person very vulnerable. So in terms of a sort of graph then, we can, we can say this. There we've got um, very little adversity, some adversity, and lots of adversity. There's the resilience, and that's how it looks. One of those inverted U curves that we like in psychology. Yeah? Um, so uh, what, I don't know what we do about that with our children. But we sort of mm. take them out to the middle of the woods and leave them there for a few hours. <laughs> Um, it's the same, a similar thing, by the way, with, um, uh, with physical um, um, uh, immunity and so on. You know, there's a, there, now we protect our children, they're so clean yeah. that they're actually quite vulnerable to infection. You know, a spoonful of dirt, actually, with all that will develop your immune system in, immensely. In, the, in, the, in a coffee break, I suggest get a spoon, go outside, <laughs> increase your immunity. Yeah? And, and now we talk about, we sometimes hear about, I don't want to get into political debate on this, but the snowflake generation, but there is the notion that our children today don't actually, uh, when, I was, when I was young, I remember, you know, and I was unusual in this, at that generation, you know, I'd go off for the day with my friends, and we'd go into the woods, and we'd go down by the river and all the rest of it, and when I came back about six o'clock, my mum would say, where have you been? Yeah? Um, I was almost a feral child, yeah? uh, and that, that doesn't happen these days. You know, we don't like to let people out of our sight. We protect them. We protect our children from all those terrible dangers out there. And then what happens? And this is my theory, uh, is that then they go to university and they're suddenly they're not being supervised, and they can't handle it. And you know this notion of crisis on campus, and you know the fact that mental health in campus is going. Well, down, you know, mental health or mental ill health is going up. It really is, uh, to some tragic extent. I think in the last four years there have actually been 250 student suicides in British universities. Much, much greater than any, in, ever before. And it might well be that, you know, people are not used to coping with, you know, a bit of difficulty uh, in their life. That's just a, a, a thing to think about and so on. Now, we've got to make a distinction. Um, between resilience as a, as a trait, as a personality trait, and as a state. Because, although we tend to think of it as a trait, some, this person is very um, vulnerable, this person is, 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 um, uh, um, is resilient, and so on, um, the fact is that a person's resilience level will vary from day to day, and indeed from hour to hour. If you just had a letter and you open it and it, it's bad news, or an email and it's bad news, you're resilient, that will knock you. And when you're not, your resilience goes down. So, so we can talk about resilience going up you know, by the hour, as it were, or down by the hour, but also there is this, it's a very similar thing to this, specificity of areas of resilience, but also a general as well. And then if we think about it in the context, stress and resilience, in the context of mental health, uh, that's very, uh, a very interesting area, and an important area, um, and everyone we know has their breaking point. Everyone has too much stress and they topple over, as it were, they have a breakdown of some sort, whatever diagnosis it is. And the breaking down or the going into the mental ill health area is related to two factors. One is the amount of stress that they're experiencing, and the second one is their resilience level. So if they have high resilience, then in a sense they can take more stress. But if they have low resilience, if they're vulnerable, then relatively little stress might tip them over. So resilience level here is how much they can take. 
So here we've got another graph. Stress is in that dimension, resilience in that, and here's what we're saying. That there is an area which we will call mental health, and I mean in a positive way, mentally healthy. And there is another area, this is a conceptual thing, it's not an empirical uh, plot or anything, but there is an area of mental ill health. And you can see that somebody who is in the highly, uh, highly vulnerable area will take very little stress before they flip over into mental ill health. Whereas somebody at the other extreme, highly resilient, they will be able to take all of that, but there might well come a point where they flip over and they can't take any more. How could we help people to stay in the zone, in the blue zone? the mentally healthy zone, well there are two things that you can work it out as well of what you can do. One is you can help them to lower their stress right, with various coping strategies and so on, and you can, you can help them to build their resilience. So you want to bring it down and you want to bring it to the right, and that way you're very likely uh, to be able to stay successful to stay in the blue zone. Okay, so that's and that a lot of that is what we'll be covering uh, 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 over the weekend. Now the thing is that resilience can be increased. You can do things that will increase your resilience. We know that people can build their strength to withstand the impact of external stressors. Secondly, people can learn skills that will enable them to cope with stresses and also with uh, stress. So we need to appreciate personal resilience. Before exploring ways of increasing resilience, it's good to <coughs> recognize times when you've shown strong resilience. Okay? So we're going to do a little um, activity now. Uh, you will do an activity. Um, and uh, it's a sensitive one because what I want you to do is think about times when you have been resilient and I want you if you are prepared and, and, and happy to do so to share with people in your group a time when you were up against it but you did pretty well you showed resilience so we want you to recall but say that don't imagine you as any pressure for you to come out with something that still stings that still hurts that's still jagged and you don't want to disclose. You have no pressure at all to disclose anything that you're uncomfortable with, okay? Really look after your safety, look after your own and my safety. So, this is it. It's me at my resilient best. That's all of you at your resilience. What's your story, okay? Recall a time when you were up against, but you managed to cope pretty well. And it's how I managed to get through a tough time. It might have been bullying at school. It might have been an illness. It might have been um, uh, the loss of a relationship, and so on. That's the caution sign. I've said it already, right? No pressure on you at all. If you don't want to say anything, you don't need to say it, right? Only what you're comfortable. So it could be a bereavement, a job loss, for example, this is not an exhaustive, whatever you like, the end of a relationship, a serious health condition. Take just 30 seconds to think about what you would be prepared, just in your little group. Okay? You might want to split the tables into two very small groups, that's up to you. And then discuss. It says here in pairs or groups of three. I'll leave it to you how you're going to split your tables, okay? But I'd like you to do that. Uh, and if you spend uh, about five minutes or so, uh, try and give everybody who, in your little group, it's probably best to have twos or threes, don't have people, because right? so you won't have time. Talk about your res resilience if, if you're prepared to do so, okay? But no pressure, really don't want anybody going into it, out of their comfort zone. Go for it for five minutes. Okay.